My name is Amy Roof. I am a rising senior in the MDiv program here at Princeton Theological Seminary. I'm also a chaplain candidate in the United States Navy. It's an honor and a privilege and a joy to introduce our speaker this morning, Ch Chief of Navy Chaplains, Rear Admiral, Reverend Dr. Margaret Grin Kibben. Speaking of her call to ministry, Chaplain Kibben once said, I wanted to eat, sleep, breathe and endure the same thing my congregation was eating, sleeping, breathing, and enduring. She wanted to be where it matters, when it matters, with what matters, so that sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and their families could grow in their faith, become certain of their moral and ethical foundations, free and able to exercise and enjoy a community of faith. This became her vision for the Navy Chaplain Corps. The AAEC Service Award, which Chaplain Kibben received on Monday, celebrates alumni who embody the mission of the seminary and who utilize their gifts in a creative way, seeking to increase the kingdom of God through their particular vocations. Chaplain Kibben sees her job as a gateway, a way to encourage others to explore their spiritual journeys. Even if her constituents practice a different faith tradition or don't consider themselves to be religious at all, she believes that providing a place to have meaningful conversations allows God to move. Chaplain Kibben earned her Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary in 1986. She earned her Doctor of Ministry in 2002, also from Princeton. Chaplain Kibben served on the Board of Trustees from 2014 to 2015. She was a member of the Alumni Association Executive Council Region 4 from 2009 to 2011 and Region 6 from 2012 to 2014. Chaplain Kibben also served on the Women in Ministry Book Project in 2014. In addition, she holds a master's degree in National Security and Strategic Studies from the Naval War College. Chaplain Kibben also served as a senior fellow at the United States Institute of Peace from 2002 to 2003. Chaplain Kibben entered active duty as a chaplain in the United States Navy to eat, sleep, breathe, and endure with her people in 1986 and served with both the Marines and the Navy, including deployments to Turkey, Norway, and most recently, Afghanistan, where she served as the command chaplain for Combined Forces Afghanistan. Additionally, Chaplain Kibben served as the first female chaplain at the United States Naval Academy. <laughs> most recently, Chaplain Kibben was assigned to the office of the Chief of Chaplains. She became the 18th chaplain of the United States Marine Corps and deputy chief of Navy chaplains in July of 2010 and assumed her current role as the chief of Navy chaplains, the 26th chief of Navy chaplains on August 1st, 2014. Her personal awards include the Legion of Merit, two awards, the Bronze Star Medal, the, Sir, the Meritorious Service Medal, three awards, and the Navy Commendation Medal, three awards. Chaplain Kibben will be offering a lecture this morning entitled, At the Front Line of Faith, There is Faith at the Front Lines. Please join me in welcoming Rear Admiral Margaret Kibben. The future of the Navy is in great hands. It, it truly is a privilege to be here today. Uh, for a number of reasons. Obviously, coming back to Princeton, as everyone has said up to this point, is just so energizing, it's exciting, and then to spend some time with, with friends, with people I've not yet had the opportunity to, uh, to have a long relationship with, but uh, just in the last couple of days have come to know, uh, it is really very exciting. But the other part of it, my, as I was heading up here uh, on Monday, my husband, uh, who is a retired Marine, by the way, and uh, so we have a true Navy Marine Corps family, he is not a chaplain, so I've been working on the stars on my own crown. <laughs> but uh, he said, so is this like a retreat? I said, no, it's just a conference, you know, just people talking and, you know, occasional dinners and things. And so it's just a, just a conference. And 
darn if I didn't sit in that chapel and get filled with the, the songs and the music and then the word. Uh, and I said, oh, all right, well, even my dispensational husband had a, had a uh, premonition that this was to be a retreat. Uh, so this truly has been a retreat. And, and oh, by the way, yes, my husband is a dispensationalist, so we truly have an ecumenical marriage. <laughs> the other part about being here is to, to be aware of how God works. I did not come here necessarily with an expectation that God was going to provide a, a thread of message, but it has been very obvious to me as I prepared my heart, soul, and mouth for this morning, uh, that God has been working all the angles through the sermons, through the song, through the prayers, through the just recently the Bible study I had to step out early from, regretfully, to, to every piece that has come forward. There's a thread here. And part of that thread has to do with the fact that we are, as called in ministry, we're called to proclaim a gospel that people don't know. To use the phrase that was used earlier by uh, Dr. Wolf, that Jesus is a moral stranger. That has, that has resonated with me even before he said it. In the Methodist term, I think that's provenient grace, right? That has been a, a, a theme for me for a long time, as Amy said earlier in the introduction. Uh, the idea that I could be with my congregation to eat, sleep, and breathe, and endure the same things they are eating, sleeping, breathing, and enduring is an, was really the intent was not just to provide the transcendent presence and to be able to be there with a good word, but really in that understanding of transcendent presence to introduce people to who God is so that the stranger wouldn't be a stranger any longer. And, and that has always been with me. My, my very first call to, my very first sense of call to ministry was when I was in what was then junior high, middle school now as they call it. Uh, and as I mentioned the other day uh, at lunchtime, uh, through a youth pastor whose name, by the way, was Blair Money, if anybody knows that name. And, uh, but that sense as I was coming to discern really what that call was is this idea that I didn't want to be with my congregation just on Sundays and an occasional meeting during the week. Not that that's only where you are, but in my 17-year-old mind at that point, that's how I saw it. And I wanted to be able to walk alongside those who would not walk in the doors of our church. And there is no better place, frankly, I think, than the military service. Because as I mentioned the other day, your, the sons and daughters of your congregations, the sons and daughters of your community, who are not members of your con congregation and who would never set foot in the, in the floors of your congregation, for whatever reason, they are the ones who are serving this country. And they come from every demographic of our United States. And oh, by the way, beyond. Several who have come in uh, as immigrants and have, are working toward US citizenship through serving in our US military. So we see in our, in our world, in our institution, the full scope of the men and women that God has created and the situations in which they have been born and currently live. It's really quite a snapshot. And what an experience it has been to be able, certainly, to bring that sense of God's presence there. May I ask, though, just to get a sense of you, how many of you have ever been uh, exposed to, uh, had a friendship with, have some familiarity with military chaplaincy? Oh, man, that's great. Awesome. So, so the explanation isn't, necessar isn't necessary, however, let me just give you some context so that you understand who we are. As military chaplains, we have to be ordained, certified, licensed, or otherwise set apart, depending on the faith tradition, as clergy or leaders within that faith tradition, within that religious organization. We have to have the bona fides that say that we represent the traditions from which we come. And the bona fides are, as, as laid out in policy, they are that they will, every one of us will have gone not only through a bachelor's degree, but then we will have a two-year master's degree in pastoral studies. So you may be a terrific architect, but that does not necessarily make you the builder of God's church, right? 
The idea is that you will have some grounding in theology and pastoral care and pastoral studies in your faith tradition. This is really important, and I will I'll iterate that again, and then I'll explain why. Then, following that two years, and by the way, within that two years of, pastoral, of, uh, of master's degree studies, two-thirds has to be in residence. Now, this is unique to the Navy. The Army and the Air Force haven't broken the code yet, but frankly, I think we get better candidates when they have had a chance to sit around the table at dinner and work through that horrid lecture they sat through earlier in the day, <laughs> or that they've been wrestling with a text as they're preparing for the sermon for their internship or their field education, or as they just kind of work through the fact that I was raised, born and raised in the Presbyterian church, and yet I'm sitting at table with people who come from other Presbyterian churches or from other faith traditions and yet we're sitting in the same classroom, how does that work itself out? How does it work itself out within me and my own understanding of vocation, my own understanding of the proclamation of the word? How do I defend myself with people who are of like mind or perhaps mildly different mind, but who, you know, we're all together in this thing. How do I work it out here first? so that I get a better sense of my own pastoral identity, I have a better sense of my own narrative. And then we require them to spend two years in pastoral work, a church, a hospital, but it has to be related to their faith tradition. Why? Because we want every chaplain who walks in here to be a representative of the faith tradition from which they come because it's the U.S. Constitution that has allowed us to serve as military chaplains to be sure that when civilian Timmy or civilian Sally decides to join the military and they've been active in that faith tradition, that though they have to extract themselves from that community of faith, they don't have to give up their faith or the free expression of it when they serve in uniform. And so the Constitution has allowed for ministers, pastors, rabbis, imams, priests from those faith traditions to serve alongside Seaman Sally, Lance Corporal Timmy, so that they can know that there is somebody who's from their faith tradition, either nearby or within easy reach. That's an important part that one needs to understand from the free expression of religion. Oh, by the way, because religion is not inherently governmental, we are there to defend the free expression of religion. So that whether a person comes from a religious organization from their community, or whether they have no faith at all, they can come to determine, discern their own faith language. They can come to understand, understand what the divine means to them. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But our representation as chaplains is to say that faith has a place in military service. We stand there with, now you can't see it on mine because I got a bunch of gold, but uh, <laughs> Chaplain Dupre, would you stand up for just a second? We have a fine representation of an active duty Navy chaplain right here in the back row. Do you happen to notice those big honking crosses on his shoulder boards? Okay. We don't walk disguised into the military. In our, in our more daily uniforms, our faith tradition is displayed loudly, proudly on our left collar. It would be a cross, it would be tablets, it's a wheel, it's uh, a, a uh, crescent. We have a representation from our faith tradition here so that when Seaman Timmy comes up to talk to me, Seaman Timmy has no doubt that I'm a person of faith. That has its pros and cons. I'll talk a little bit more about that, too. <laughs> we then, as military chaplains, must remain faithful to who we are and what we represent. Now, I will tell you that in 32 years, the Presbyterian Church has changed just a little bit. <laughs> so it's a little challenging to say I represent the Presbyterian Church because you all have moved in some directions and I have moved in others. But the reality is, I am an ordained Presbyterian minister. Every one of our chaplains, as I said, are ordained, certified, licensed, or otherwise set apart within that faith tradition as leaders. We represent, interestingly enough, 100 different faith traditions, just in the chaplaincy alone. 
Now, keep in mind, there are about 10 different kinds of Baptists <laughs> and about five different kinds of Presbyterians. And there's, you know, all sorts of small church elements to that as well. But the bottom line is we are a cacophony of faith traditions. We also then provide for, the, in the Navy's case, the, Na the sailors, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen, who come from and represent over 200 faith traditions. When an individual signs up for military service, they are asked to put down, ask, it's not a requirement, put down what their faith tradition is. And we have a, a code book that determines, you, know, you put a couple letters in there and this, you put it on your, your uh, emergency data sheet, what you are or what you claim to be, and they are identified by 200 different faith traditions. That's amazing. And they grow con continually. Think about 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. Sometimes they make up religions. <laughs> Have you heard about the Church of the Spaghetti Bowl? I am not kidding. You need to look that up. What's important, though, for, us to, as, for you to understand, for us as military chaplains, when I came into the chaplaincy, I got the question frequently, why have you left the ministry? <laughs> and I understand where that comes from. You who serve in parishes are completely immersed in the lectionary, in, in your own in doctrine, in polity. You're immersed in it. You have session meetings, sorry, I got to skip those. Um, you have opportunities where you have like mind around you, other adherents to the, you know, who adhere, co-adherents to the, to the Presbyterian faith or your faith tradition. You are immersed in it completely. And so it would be understandable when you talk to somebody who then goes out on the mission field, who is not surrounded by like-minded believers, to say, well, how are you upholding your own faith tradition? How are you upholding your responsibility to serve as a minister of the word and sacrament? How's that happen? So it's understandable that the question would be asked, but in our defense what I say is, I think because we have prepared people well enough and we've encouraged people to have that, that foundation and the, and the root structure to create a framework from which they can then work as they come into military service to say, I stand on the ground a Christian. I stand on this ground firmly in my understanding of God's grace, God's transcendence, God's presence. I can say that with a great deal of certainty even when all those around me say nay, nay. That I think is probably one of the exciting things about the kind of ministry uh, that we get to do. So the image, think about, uh, we have uh, obviously a, a, with a hundred different uh, faith traditions, think about a Roman Catholic priest who goes to mass at 6.30 in the morning and then f and, and completely immersed in the Eucharist and then fresh with that glow on his face then walks out into the command structure or out into the field or onto the deck of the ship or, or somewhere that they find themselves. That glow as if they have come down from the mountain is all around them. And, and that is true for all of us. All of us, and I encourage all of our chaplains to stay grounded in your faith. You must. We have opportunity for chaplains to come back for uh, postgraduate education. But more than just that, there's an encouragement that we have to make sure that you are, as chaplains, spiritually fit. We must not only have the education, the pedigree, and, and the theological stance, but we must also be spiritually prepared. Because the things that we see, the questions that we're asked, can rock your world. <laughs> From the very simple, like, uh, Chaplain, I, I got this question. Um, it's been bugging me, because, you know, I've been reading the Bible. And I started from page one. Oh, God, this is going to be good. <laughs> so if Adam and Eve were the first man and woman, the first couple, and they had two sons, I hate that question. <laughs> to obviously the far more profound questions that one experiences as we, as we all do in life and death situations, some more traumatic than others. To people who have no language of faith. 
that is a that is a fascinating piece here so that we as in in coming into this institution must learn the language first of the institution what is what you think is a head is different than what I think of as a head <laughs> that's the bathroom in case you're not really sure and Navy parlance the deck the bulkhead starboard port all those things and then throw in the thousands of acronyms that are so uh, unique to the military we learn the language of the institution, much like a missionary whom you send overseas to represent the faith, learns the language of that culture. The, the language, not only the, the articulate words, but the, the cultural language. What does it mean to be able to serve in this environment? And so we wear a uniform, and we, we strive to be physically fit, and we, we learn to understand that there are the ways that policy is written. There are, there are explanations for how things will take place in case war breaks out. There are, there are procedures and tactics that take place that we as chaplains must learn the language of that institution. So it, it sort of balances out our collars, if you will. I spoke to the left side of the collar, which is our faith tradition. On the right side of our collar is our rank. And it represents the fact that we are we are very much immersed in, embedded in, and woven into the fabric of military service. We wear rank so that people take us seriously, frankly. Now, the, the British Royal Navy has it slightly different, but they have a couple hundred more years of tradition than we do. And, and, and I kind of like it. It's very appealing if we didn't have the 242 years of our tradition. But in the British Royal Navy, which is fascinating, the chaplain in the Royal Navy will, will be the rank of the person with whom they're speaking. So they wear no rank. So if, if they approach Seaman Timmy, then they're Seaman Margaret. If they approach the uh, first Sea Lord, who's the equivalent to the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, the Admiral, then the chaplain is an Admiral. It's really poetic, don't you think? Wouldn't work with Americans, we're too competitive. <laughs> But there is something to be said that as we bring people into the Navy, you take a person like Amy, you bring a person into the Navy and she's motivated to serve in military chaplaincy. But there's something to be said about experience. There's something to be said about the, the, the facility one has with the language of the institution. One comes into ministry in general at the 100 level. Add into that ministry the, the language of the environment, and you're now at a kind of a complex 100 level. All of us in ministry grow in our, our ability to articulate faith and our ability to, our, to communicate within a particular setting in a certain environment at the 300 level and the 400 level. That is, is, is concurrent with uh, a promotion. So I speak a different language to the chief of naval operations or to other admirals than I did, that I could have when I was a lieutenant JG, aside from the fact that I would have been quaking in my boots and too afraid to say anything. So there's something to be said about learning that language of that institution, but really the other part of it is that we have to learn the language of the people who are entering into the institution as well. Amy mentioned my... my phrase, chaplains are where it matters, when it matters, with what matters. I have to tell you, I stole that, at least two-thirds of it, from the former chief of naval operations, who was all about, you know, the, the phrase that you use for the Navy, you know, whether it's America's Navy or whether it's, uh, oh, heck, what's the new phrase, Lieutenant? Forged by the sea. Forged by the sea, right? <laughs> so the Navy the nation needs. All right, that's, those are phrases, and they're wonderful, and they, they, they catch you, right? Well, it was before uh, where it matters and when it matters, which is a great phrase when you start thinking about how ships are forward deployed and troops go forward and so forth. Well, my sense of that was is that we as chaplains, as much a part of the Navy as anyone else, are not only where it matters and when it matters, and I'll talk to you that a little bit more, but with what matters. There is definitely something unique that we bring to the table. You tie those two corners of the collar together and you get a completely different recipe that, uh, that people need. So let me talk to you a little bit about being where it matters. We as military chaplains, but specifically as Navy chaplains, the Navy serves, the Navy chaplains serve the Navy, the Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. They are my chaplains, the, the 1,500 that, that uh, report ultimately to me, active duty and reserves. And they are everywhere. You, they are in Japan, they're in Italy, they are, 
They are underway in the Mediterranean. They're in the Persian Gulf right now. They are you know, up in Maine. They're down in Florida. They're in San Diego because somebody has to be. <laughs> <laughs> They are at training commands. They are at, on ships. They're in hospitals. They're, at, uh, they're in chapels. They're at every place you can possibly think where there might be a sailor or a marine or a coast guardsman. And if their office is separate from where everybody else is, they spend the time getting out there to see them. And they can do it that a host of different ways. I was talking to a, a prior uh, a destroyer sailor earlier, and he said, have you been on the high line lately? By the way, that is not a, not a, not a reference to drug use, OK? Uh, that the high line was this really bizarre wire they would string between two ships and as they would come alongside. Now think what that happens that, right? OK, there's a little Bernoulli effect happening, so there's a lot of waves. There's some bouncing around. Small ships are not exactly uh, stable when that kind of effect happens, and they would put a a chaplain on the chair, which looked kind of like an execution style chair, <laughs> strapped in and all, and move them from one ship to another. If they happened to fall into the drink, that was called a baptism. <laughs> we don't do that anymore, thank God. We do, however, use the holy helo, uh, which is a helo will hel helicopter will take us from one ship to another. Sometimes they'll bring us down by horse collar. That's fun. <laughs> Or the righteous rib, they now call it. The rib being a, a small inflatable raft. Yeah. Um, soccer balls come to mind. But um, we go where they are. The, the phrase that I have often talked about in my own calling is to, to eat, sleep, breathe, and endure the same things my congregation was eating, sleeping, breathing, and enduring. It's true for all of us. We are out there. And, and I will tell you, this is a little plug for the Navy. If any of you are considering military service, uh, I suggest you go to the Navy. Uh, we have a recruiter here, by the way. Um, <laughs> but um, the reason why I, I really am keen on the Navy is that that has been, to be where it matters has been our currency. I have gone to other commands where we've, for whatever reason, a Navy chaplain has appeared and been participating in the ministry and that team. And, and people who've been on that command for years say, man, your chaplain comes around to see us. And I'm thinking, yeah. And the others didn't. Oh, no, we never saw them, not for years, ever. So chaplains, we, I mean, here's the fun thing, right? I, those of you who are, are senior ministers, think about the, the, the uh, CEOs in the companies that are represented in your congregations. I can go in to the CEO of the Navy who's called the CNO, and have a cup of coffee with him. Can you? Can you walk into the, the local uh, garage and find one of your congregation members who's tinkering on a car and sit down and just say, hey, how's that going? And not be worried about whether you're going to get greasy or not. I don't wear my whites, by the way, on those visits. <laughs> To be able to just come alongside and, and see what they're doing, to be where it matters. I, I have, one of my favorite stories I, I enjoy sharing is that uh, serving with Marines, you get to do a lot of where it matters. Uh, you know, you're out in the dirt, you're doing all those fun things that Marines do, and, and from, the, from the garrison to in combat, we are there, at the front lines, truly. Our history is ripe with chaplains who have demonstrated the courage that it takes to be there in the thick of things without a weapon, by the way, as we are non-combatants. You want to talk about a testimony of faith? Oh, my goodness. Perhaps a little less serious, but, but the, the reality is because we are where it matters, people find us. So the story I, I enjoy telling is that I was with Marines at one point, and, and we were uh, all lined up to go on a hike. Marines love to hike. Not sure what that's all about. And if hiking isn't good enough, by gosh, you got to put a 40-pound pack on your back. All right? And you start in the middle of the night. So there it is dark, and we're all camouflaged, and I'm, and I'm working the line, because that's what chaplains do, right? It's that, somebody called it schmoozing. I just call it, you know, the small talk, which, by the way, I hate. I hate small talk. But it's one of those things you learn how to do as a chaplain. Hey, how you doing? Great day for a walk today, huh? How are things going? Have you ever done this before? What's in your pack? Did you pack your pack today? So I'm walking down the line, and the guy next to me, uh, as I'm passing through, one of the fellows that I had already passed said, now, you have to remember, I'm a sailor, and I'm talking about Marines, so protect your ears. Who the F was that? <laughs> Only he didn't abbreviate. 
And the guy next to him said, well, that was the chaplain. And you could see this guy, and remember, it's dark, you just kind of, you could see his eyes back up, and he goes, oh, shit. <laughs> so, but let's call this guy Lance Corporal Smith, all right? And I looked at Lance Corporal Smith, and I said, hey, Smith, nice to meet you, all right? So then we headed off on this hike, and, and they put me at the front of the line with the commanding officer. I think that's part of the, they don't want chaplains to get lost. We're prone to that, by the way. <laughs> And, uh, and we're not quite as fit as most Marines, so they make sure that they can, you know, carry us should anything happen. But anyway, I'm in the front of the line with the commanding officer, and we have a thing that they call the guide on. It is exactly that. You want to guide on this flag. It's a pole. has a small flag on it. And uh, Marines being the motivated souls that they are, one fellow comes up, grabs the guide on, and runs around the formation. It's a fairly large formation, so it's really motivating to see somebody do that because it's just, it's just fun. Well, it's Lance Corporal Smith, whom, as you've probably figured out by now, is a bit of a character. So he grabs the guide on, and he makes his trip round. And I, as he's coming around my flank, I look at him and I said, hey, Smith, one more time round for penance. <laughs> so, so, so Lance Corporal Smith, you know, good-natured, all fine. The day goes on, we have, we have gone out, we've done the routines we're gonna do, there's an operation, it's, a, it's full of everything from, from shooting to tanks to everything that you could possibly imagine. Long, long day. At the end of the day, I'm walking around the compound and just trying to check in with people. How are you doing? How was the day today? Did you go okay? Did you survive that hike? How, how'd you shoot today? You know, that small talk. And as I was going through there, a Marine comes up to me, it was Lance Corporal Smith. He says, hey chaplain, you got a minute? and out came his life story. Because I was where it mattered from the beginning of the day, he was ready to be able to, he was ready to talk to me when he needed to talk. So we're not only where it matters, we're there when it matters. And when it matters means not only moments like that with Lance Corporal Smith, but the when it matters is in those moments of crisis as you can possibly imagine. Because we are out and about, we are experiencing people's full life cycles. From the Red Cross message that comes through that says that their wife has had a baby, we're there with them in the absence of that moment. We're also there when it matters, when they get the Dear John or their Dear Jane letter. Those are the simple things, right? But you think about the life cycle of humanity. We see it every day to come alongside following a roadside bomb and to minister to the people not only who have been, whose convoy has been struck, but to minister to, the, to the, the medics, as the Army calls them, the corpsmen, as we call them, to minister to the corpsmen as they are picking up the pieces. I'm sorry to be so graphic. But it is when it matters. You've been there. You've been there along bedsides. We're there on a regular basis. And we're there to advocate for people who are, who are just trying to wrestle with growing up. Right? There's a whole bag of hormones that comes in with an 18 or 19 year old when they enlist. Right? And they're still working through all that. And, and how do you bring them you know, through those life crises and decisions that they have to make? We are there when it matters. When something happens, chaplains who have been with we're with our people in every clime and every place. And then when they turn to us, we bring to them what matters. So I spoke initially about how we provide for the religious needs of our people. We provide for those who are of like mind. I take care of the other Presbyterians who are out there, all five of them. And Work on that, would you? Okay, I, 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 get the whole, I get the whole peace church thing. I got all that. But there's something about military service that helps your children grow up. Um, we're there to facilitate for people who are of other faith traditions. So I'm not just there for the Presbyterians. In fact, that was one of the, the, one of the gracious things about the way the Constitution was written is that we're there to ensure that everyone has free expression of religion. And our responsibility of the, as the agent to that free expression of religion allows us to facilitate for the young Catholic fellow who comes up and says, I need to have, I need to take mass, I need to, to give a confession. Now, I'm not Father Mulcahy, I'm not gonna put my hat on and take a Catholic confession, 
but I am going to connect him with a chaplain, a priest, when we can. It may be a while, and there's a lot of interim work that takes place, obviously, right? But regardless of one's faith tradition as they come in, I am required to facilitate for that faith tradition, no matter how abhorrent I think that faith is, oh, by the way. That's a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us, frankly, whether we are uh, Presbyterian Christians, whether we're evangelical Christians, whether we're Muslims. There's a, there's a, there's a dissonance there, right? I said I'm well grounded in my faith tradition, but I have a responsibility to facilitate for everyone on that front line so that they have their language of faith protected, exercised, not exorcised. <laughs> That's our responsibility. We cannot evangelize in, the, in, the, in a sense of proselytizing. Now, I'll tell you, just by walking around the room with a big honking cross on your, on your collar is a bit of evangelism, okay? That, that, it works that way. But we're there just alongside. There's enough gospel there in itself if we're doing it right. Always preach the gospel, sometimes use words. But our third core capability, one of our core capabilities is to advise commanders. That's our fourth core capability. And so the commander ultimately has the responsibility for all of his or her people. And so my responsibility as the agent to the delivery of religious ministry is to keep, make sure that the commander knows what's up. And that works out really well if the person is a person of faith sometimes, because, but sometimes they're so parochial, they don't understand how there can be this plethora of belief out there but our responsibility to talk to the commander about not only the expression of faith, but how are their people doing? It's the one question we get asked most from commanding officers. Chaps, how are my people doing? And they don't necessarily want you to say fine. Well, Skipper, I need to tell you a few things. I'm a little concerned about. There's a trend going on here. I'm picking up some tension over here. I'm really, I can't, but we have, because we have complete confidentiality, which I'll talk to in just a second, complete, absolutely complete, nothing. We are not allowed to report anything. Not child abuse, not spouse abuse, family domestic abuse. We are not allowed to report it to ensure that everyone has an opportunity for sanctuary. That's part of our other core capability, which is care for all. Again, I, I mean to unpack that in just a second. But think about the commanding officer who has responsibility for the health and welfare of all these people. And if that sort of stuff is going down within their command, how do I help the commander navigate those waters? That's our responsibility to the commander as well. We also talk to the opportunity to talk to the commander about what we look like when we go forward overseas. My responsibility as the chaplain of Afghanistan, I was the senior chaplain there in theater. And not only was I responsible for the, all the chaplains who were there, Army and Air Force, Navy, and all our service members and their religious exercise, but I was also the advisor to the senior chaplain, if you will, for the Afghan National Army. I was also the advisor to the minister for religion and Hajj for the Afghan government. That advisement role to my commander, based on the relationships that I had with those two individuals, was, was rich. And the responsibility that we had to ensure as an institution that we were representing respect and dignity to those with whom we were serving alongside was critical. So one day, we had a, we had a terrible event happen. The Army had a truck called a Hemet which is a, a rather large beast, and it was coming down a hill in the center of Kabul, and it lost its brakes. And in losing its brakes, uh, it had to avoid crowds of people and crashed into two cars. However, two people were killed. Young soldiers who were manning this Hemet, and they immediately went into defensive and, from a perspective, offensive positions, guns pointed and so forth. So, the, the, the whole city erupted with, with violence. And because the network within Afghanistan is just completely incendiary, all right, there are 13th century people with 21st century communications. All right, they know how to work their cell phones. The entire country lit up within 24 hours. 
So we went on lockdown. And in lockdown, we had a crisis action team meeting to say, now what do we do? How do we get around this? You know, it starts with the, with the traffic accident. How do we get into this from a national perspective? And in this, I walked into this crisis action team meeting and the, uh, one of the individuals said, oh man, it must be bad if the chaplain's here. And I said, well, what part of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan don't you all get? Oh. So as they were sorting out what they would do next, they decided to send the canary out into the coal mine. And who was that canary? The one who goes unarmed, right, in a soft vehicle, a vehicle that I is not up armored, to go talk to the minister of Hajj and religious affairs. That's the kind of advisement we have the ability to do because we are people of faith. The rest of the world gets faith and religion, right? They may not get ours, but they get the language of faith. And I might be a small white Christian woman, but darn it, I'm a chaplain. And they understood that. They also understand rank, which is fascinating too. But the advisement role we have is critical. So I've talked about provide, facilitate, and advise, but I really want to zero in on care in, this, in a short bit of time I have left. Care is really the crux of who we are and really what I want to be able to share with you about. It's critical. We talk a lot about how the, the, the language is different, right? There, the environment in which we're serving right now and in the 32 years that I've been on active duty, it's different. When I walked into military chaplaincy in 1986, people understood the language of faith. You could talk about things like forgiveness and reconciliation and guilt. You could talk about those things with people and it was okay. You could say, what's your faith tradition? And they'd have an answer, unapologetically have an answer. As the decades have gone on, there's been a little bit more discomfort with that question. What's your faith tradition? Well, I haven't been to church in a while. Sometimes that's how the conversation starts. I don't even have to ask right? The, there's like this thing, confess all your sins when you walk in the chaplain's door and out it comes. So you get through, through those first five minutes and then you work through it. But the, the reality is, as the years have gone by, what we have been so fluent in as clergy and comfortable with in our answers is completely foreign to those whom we serve. And yet, as St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. The restlessness of the men and women whom we serve are people who are looking for something to say or to grasp or to find meaning or to find authenticity. And they have found in us that sanctuary, that freedom, partly because of our confidentiality, because we do have the ability to hear it all. And man, I think I've heard it all. Actually, every time I think I've heard it all, a new story comes in. To share that, to let them speak from their perspective, from, from their experience, and to help them sort through what it means to be in this middle, in this, in this moral desert, where Jesus is a stranger, and so is everyone else. And yet they, they have found, because we have been where it matters, and when it matters, that what we have to share does matter to them. It's important for them to have a sense of belonging. By the way, that's not just for millennials. To have a sense of someone respects them, to have someone who cares for them authentically, someone with whom that they can share anything and there is no judgment but when the time is right, can offer a word of hope or maybe just a presence of love. That's really where our, where the wealth of our ministry is, is to enable our young men and women, and oh, by the way, the not so young men and women who are just as restless, to find where their hearts can find rest. We don't have we, we come with a, a, a language that is countercultural. We all do. But the exciting thing about what ministry can do on the front lines is that because we are immersed in that culture, we find ways to translate that message. 
and we find ways to come alongside the Lance Corporal Smiths, the Seaman Sallies, the people who are searching and yearning for something so that when they finish military service, whether it's after four years or 32, and they return to their communities, they might go to you. Because we've prepped the, prepped the way, we are the John the Baptist to your ministry. And I'm, I'm really keen with that. I'm not keen on locusts, but I'm, I'm keen with, <laughs> MREs are much better, but I, I'm keen on the fact that we can help them find something that they want to explore further. What an excitement that is. As an aside, however, I would argue that ministry in the 21st century is going to look more like what we do than what you do. I, I would love to see you sit in Starbucks. Wear a collar, psychs people out, right? But it intrigues them. Hey, who are you? Where do you work? Maybe, maybe the next time you get your car serviced, you go back in the garage, don't wear whites. But the reality is people need what we bring. You don't need a uniform. You don't need to have a commission, a military commission, that is. But we each have a commission, don't we? To spread the gospel where it's needed most. Sometimes that isn't the pews. So it's a privilege to be serving you and to serve this country. And I appreciate the fact that uh, we've spent a little time together, and I would love to entertain your questions.